good evening, good day, depending where you are on the planet. And good day to you too, Marcos. How you doing, mate? Good, mate. And hello to all of you. Great. So this is our sixth lesson. And today, this lesson, this, well, like all the lessons in the Learning Center, this, this is also a very fundamental lesson. Because today, what we're going to learn about is uh, how to actually understand what they're all talking about in the books. Uh, obviously, when they say what they're talking about, we're talking about Kabbalists, how they wrote the text, um, and what do we need to do in order to come to the real meaning. Because if we look at our historical past, we see that there's a lot of confusion over what they've written. And because of that, we have a lot of methods, a lot of like ideologies, belief systems, and everything, simply because these guys wrote about something very basic and very simple, and everybody got the wrong idea. So before we go ahead with the lesson, here's a clip from the Rav that we should listen to so he can give us a good definition on what it means to really attain and understand these Kabbalistic texts. When a person achieves spirituality, does he achieve it in a way of spirit? Suppose if now I am um, suddenly in attainment, I start understanding Zor and Tess, as if th that's what's supposed to happen? When you will come into attainment, then first of all, you get a feeling. It's everything about feeling, because we're talking about the desire. Inside the desire, you'll feel a certain phenomenon. And you will suddenly know how to call that specific phenomenon. What is it? Suddenly you'll know that it's, oh, it means this and it means that. And, oh, I remember that it said this and that about this. Or we've learned it one way or another you'll suddenly recall all that has to do with that attainment you have achieved. Instantaneously, all at once, both the word as to how to call it, also the state itself, where does it say about it, from what you've learned, from what you know. You will know everything about that very phenomena that you will attain, that you will feel. But first of all comes the feeling. The first thing that we need to develop through the study is obviously that feeling. So the lesson, this lesson is called the language of roots and branches. And this is actually how the Kabbalists express themselves, by defining things that are in the upper worlds through their branches in this world. Okay. Now, as usual, we're going to go ahead with the Kabbalah for the student book. So if you got it, great. If you don't, you know, you can always download this as a PDF from the website, I do believe. We're going to read from page 25 and as usual if you have any questions at all regarding this lesson and what we're studying right now please don't hesitate to drop them on the chat box we'll do our best to answer those questions as best we can and if we can't manage it they all go to the forum anyway and you'll get it answered somehow okay so let's take a look at what the Kabbalists are writing page 25 um, in the Kabbalah for the student and the article is called The Essence of the Wisdom of Kabbalah. And we're going to read a bit further down towards the bottom. So it's the third paragraph from the bottom in the middle, where it says, where each lower world. Okay, so I'll carry on reading and we'll take it from there. Where each lower world is an imprint of the world above it. Hence, all the forms in the higher world are meticulously copied in both quantity and quality to the lower world. Thus, there is not an element of reality or an occurrence of reality in a lower world that you will not find its likeness in the world above it, as identical as two drops in a pond. And they are called root and branch. That means that the item in the lower world is deemed a branch of its pattern found in the higher world, being the root of the, of the lower element, as this is where the item in the lower world was imprinted and made to be. Okay, so before, as you know, we did learn 
that there were five worlds. Okay, so when he's talking about here, basically just the five worlds which we studied before, we know about them, but it's worthwhile going over everything we did learn before so that it kinda of, kinda of gets into us. Adam Kadmon, Absolute, Briya, Yitzira, Asiya. Okay. And this is our world here. Okay. Our world. So first of all, the everything that the Kabbalists are talking about in their books, okay, relate <clears throat> Okay, relate to these levels here. They're not talking about anything else. When they talk, when they write, they're just describing to us everything here, which is above our world. All right? So they're not talking about this world at all. And one of the biggest confusions is because we think they might be. So what the book is telling us here is, the worlds, all of them, actually are a copy of each other. And what they are is that the, the upper world is the root for the lower one. Okay? And if we understand that, we can have a proper approach. And that the only thing that we're attaining, actually, is a deeper understanding of what there is in the upper world. So, one above is a root and the below is a branch, and that's how it goes. And all the details are the same. So there is not one detail in the lower world that's not in the upper world, and everything comes down from the upper world. So it's like a, it's like a template. Okay. Um, there we go. Maybe uh, just a bit of a disclaimer at this point, uh, because we've read a whole bunch of texts up until now in this course as well, uh, we just got to differentiate between what's a text in the language of Kabbalah and, and what's uh, these other texts we've read up until now. Uh, for example, in the first lesson we read a definition about Kabbalah that, that Bala Salam gave, uh, and since then we've gone over a few excerpts. So we have to understand how these excerpts and definitions we've been reading up until now, and which we'll continue reading, uh, were from certain articles and essays that were written by Kabbalist Yehuda Ashlag, Bala Sulam. And he was the first Kabbalist who started writing texts in such a way, in, in this way where he's actually not uh, writing based on those upper worlds, but he is writing to people here in, in our world, in this world, uh, in order to give us this foundation for being able to attain the upper worlds. That's actually something very new and never existed in the wisdom of Kabbalah up until the 20th century, and only uh, Bal HaSulam did that, and then Rabash also continued uh, that line of things as well. Rabash was his son and disciple, and also the teacher of Rav Michael Leitman, who continued the teachings and, and founded uh, the Bnei Baruch Kabbalah Education and Research, uh, in Research Institute. So what, what I'm trying to say here is that all Kabbalistic texts throughout history uh, including many of the texts as well that Bala Salam wrote, were written in the language of Kabbalah, which, as Mutlus wrote, did speak about only what's above our world, only what's above the barrier between our world and those spiritual worlds, Adam Kadmon, Atilut, Briya, Yetzir Asiya. And what, what these Kabbalistic texts wrote about were as if to communicate from one Kabbalist to another Kabbalist. Similar to science in this world, how you have uh, all kinds of scientists and they reach whatever attainments they, they reach in their sciences, and they write all kinds of scientific articles to each other, which they publish in all kinds of academic journals, and only other scientists who, who study the same science, for example, a physicist, I would be able to read these texts and understand the formulas and, and the whole thinking behind it. So it's very similar to, to the language of Kabbalah that we're speaking about now, that they'd write about the spiritual world and they'd write about it to other Kabbalists and other Kabbalists who also attain, have some kind of attainment of the spiritual worlds, would be able to understand it, maybe use something from it to attain onwards, etc. But in the 20th century and onwards, we also have these other texts which we're not speaking about at this point. Uh, the texts which are the, as we said, the articles and essays of Bala Sulam, which he wrote because he saw that there's a need for the disclosure 
of the wisdom of Kabbalah from the 20th century onwards, meaning that he, he knew how and felt how people would start having this question about the meaning of life more and more on, on a basis where it would start revealing in humanity as a whole. And therefore, that, according to that need, he, he wrote uh, these articles and essays which give us a grounding for the wisdom of Kabbalah, which are not written in the language of Kabbalah, but which are written in ordinary popular language in order to give people some kind of grounding in the wisdom in order for us to understand the principles, similar to what we're doing now, explaining the principles of the language of Kabbalah so that we'd be able to come and then approach the language of Kabbalah. Um, so that, that's what those are. And that's similar as well to science as well. How you, have, you have many, many, many scientists writing in, in this scientific language to each other, publishing in, in all kinds of journals, academic journals, etc., communicating to each other. And then there's a few scientists who have that extra ability to write uh, popular science, uh, and, they, and they write books that can communicate all kinds of concepts that they discover and, and communicate in, in a difficult language with all kinds of formulas that we don't really understand, those who don't study that science. And they can communicate those in, at the level of all kinds of principles to people, just uh, to the general public. Uh, for example, Stephen Hawking and, and all kinds of people like these who, who communicate these things, and we, get, we can get some kind of understanding and grounding for those things. Absolutely. So what Kabbalists have done for us, something very, very nice and easy, in order to describe what's in the upper world, they've used the things that we see in this world. Okay, so it's very, very nice and easy. All we have to do is look at this world, okay, and from this world, as we study, here are the branches, uh, sorry, here is the roots for everything, okay, and in our world, here are the branches, and what they're doing basically are explaining to us the roots with the world with the words from this world okay now you might be surprised to know that although we say we are studying kabbalah we're actually not okay because studying kabbalah just like the rav said a minute ago is attainment it means that i attain the upper world first i get that sensation and then i understand also my sensation and live in a spiritual state and the reason that we're also confused about Kabbalistic texts just like Marcus said in the in the previous generations Kabbalists wrote to themselves to each other about spiritual attainment so all of the spiritual attainment is above here in attainment so actually studying Kabbalah starts once we cross to this new reality and so what are we doing here you might ask well here we're studying how to be Kabbalists so that through that study we can actually come to an attainment and then really get into the nitty-gritty of the stuff uh, and actually understand what they're talking about in the texts when they talk about special things which we will come to in a minute actually so it's very important to know that understand that a Kabbalist is actually not a student who studies Kabbalah but one who's already in attainment and is in the spiritual worlds and is studying the spiritual worlds at a deeper and deeper level. So what we're called in our state when we study is we're in a preparation level. Okay, so we're going to carry on reading and what have we got to read? We've got to read from page 26. Now this article, The Essence of the Wisdom of Kabbalah, is very, very important um, in order for us to get a grasp of how they wrote and why they wrote the things they did. And this article will actually reduce the confusions that we have about understanding these texts. So, coming down to the third paragraph from the top on page 26, let's see what they're writing here. Thus, Kabbalists have found a set of annotated vocabulary sufficient to create an excellent spoken language. It enables them to converse with one another of the details in the spiritual roots in the upper worlds by merely mentioning a, the tangible branch in this world that is well defined to our corporeal senses. As you can see here, he mentions Kabbalists. Okay? So they found a way to communicate amongst themselves. The listeners understand the upper root to which this corporeal branch points because it is related to it being its imprint. Thus all the beings of the tangible creation and all their instances have become to them like a well-defined, 
words and names indicating the high spiritual roots. Although there cannot be a verbal expression in their spiritual place, as it is above any imagination, they have earned the right to be expressed by utterance through their branches arranged before our senses here in the tangible world. Okay, so this obviously language is also very, very important for us because it also allows us to start relating to things, okay, from blow up. Now, the whole idea of this language of roots and branches and why we study from the roots is so that first we can understand the cause, which is up here in the roots, okay, this is the cause for everything in our world, okay, and here we have the consequence, okay? So everything that happens in this world, oops, you'll have to excuse my writing, okay? Causes and consequences. So everything that happens in our world purely depends on the upper world. So therefore, in order for us to understand what's happening here in this world, we first have to understand what's going on up there, all right? And as it writes here, it says everything, okay? Everything relates to us from the upper world. So every thought that we have, every desire that we have, every movement that we make is actually a consequence of what's happening from the upper worlds, all right? Any questions there, Marcos, or are we... Um, just someone's asking, uh, Iris from uh, Fadlon is asking, what is the Shoresh... Uh, is it our thoughts or intention, intentions, or is it something else? Shores as well being the Hebrew word for root. Okay, we're going to get, we're going to read some interesting text in a minute, and we'll see there how to relate to some words. But shoresh means the root. Okay, so the root of everything. Actually, what we call shoresh would be the creator. Okay, shoresh, the root of everything. And everything actually comes from the Creator. And actually, as we learned in our previous lessons, if you recall how the Creator first created us in perfection, then He broke us, and He brought us to the sensation of this world, which is the second phase of our development. And from here, as you know, we spiritually ascend back to the root of creation. Okay, so that's where the root is in the first phase where the Creator created all of us in perfection. And everything stems from that, from that thought of creation, where everything happened. You see, the Creator already created everything in an instant from A to Z, as we learned before. And since that is the root of everything, Shoresh is the root, the Creator, being His thought of creation when He first created everything. Maybe just to give another, uh, yeah, just pass us the book for a second. Yeah, absolutely. There just to go. give an example, because maybe maybe you haven't actually encountered the actual language of Kabbalah yet. I'm just going to try open to a fairly random page uh, in the let's say the preface to the wisdom of Kabbalah. So that's already one article uh, by Bala Sulam, uh, which is written in the language of Kabbalah, and where he's explaining to us. Still in an introductory way, he's still giving us an introduction to the whole, uh, to the sphere or to the parts of him and the upper worlds. But just just to get get like some kind of understanding or some kind of taste of what it means to read a bit of a text in the language of Kabbalah, I'll just uh, go a little bit towards the end. And don't think you have to understand this or anything. Uh, so this is just item, for example, item 168 from Preface to the Wisdom of Kabbalah, just a little bit of it. So thus, when Partsuf Atik de Atzilut obtained these Mochim de Bina, it rises and clothes Partsuf Bina de Ak, opposite the level of Sag de Partsuf Galgata de Ak, from which it receives its Pchinat Neshama de Echida de Ak, which shines for his Zat too. And when the Mochim come to Partsuf Arich Anpin de Atzilut, it ascends and clothes the Rosh de Atik of the constant state, opposite the level of Sag of Partsuf Ab de Ak, from which it receives Bechinat Neshama de Haya de Ak, which shines for its Zat. Okay, so I won't go on. As you can see, there's lots of Hebrew words there, there's lots of uh, words you don't really understand. And also, don't think that just by giving a literal, literal translation of each one of these words, 
that you're going to understand this text. Th that, that's a text, uh, that's a classic example of a text in the language of Kabbalah. Uh, talk, speak, where each word speaks and points to a specific root uh, in the upper worlds. Like, for example, just take the word partzuf. Partzuf, you'll see this word a lot in, in the Kabbalistic texts. So partzuf, if you do a literal translation of the word partzuf, so it means face. If you walk around in Israel where people speak Hebrew, so you'll hear that word just mentioned a lot on the streets. You know, partzuf, you know, this guy's partzuf, this person's face. Uh, but in this case, it, it's not speaking about a face at all. It's speaking about a spiritual entity, which once we get deeper into the study and once we actually attain the causal levels of existence, so we actually see what, what that means, a partzuf, a spiritual entity, and how it doesn't mean a face at all. But this is the word that, that's been defined to it, and it speaks specifically to that uh, spiritual entity. And it's like that with all these words. Mochin as well literally means mind, but again, it doesn't mean mind the way we understand our minds here in this world. But, uh, but again, it, it points to a specific spiritual root where once we, we can only attain that root, and from there we can understand it. So, you know, then there arises the question, what's, what, 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 what's the whole approach to studying texts like these before we attain it? Which we'll, we'll also speak about now more into the lesson. Uh, but, yeah, just to give you a little bit of an example of what we're talking about when we're speaking about the language of Kabbalah, that it's, that it's these kinds of texts. Also, uh, Balo Sulam's Talmud Esas Firot, the study of the Ten Firot, which is a huge six-volume work. So that's also written in the language of Kabbalah. Uh, preface to the Wisdom of Kabbalah is as an introduction to that. And, uh, and there's, there's a few more texts like this as well of Bala Salams, and as we said, many texts from before Bala Salam. Ooh, <laughs> I just lost your page. That's right, my page turns <laughs> through, that's all right, that's all good. So basically, if we just go back to that drawing as well, basically, all we're doing is studying the upper wor worlds, the roots, Okay, through um, through the branches in this world. Now, Marcus said something very nice and um, nice, and he read something very specific. Parts of actually, in your previous lessons, why I want to touch on it. In your previous lessons, we talked about intention, right? And parts of actually here, when we're talking about a desire to receive with an intention to bestow. So, although it means face in literal Hebrew, a part suf means an entity who can bestow back to the Creator. So it's a desire to receive with a screen, and as you might have heard, a screen is called a masach. Okay, so although these sound technical, it's like in medicine they use a lot of Latin words, right? So the Kabbalists are using these as well in order to describe upper worlds. So it's very, very important. Also, one more thing to note, behind the book is a dictionary. Thank goodness, Baal HaSulam did us a favor as well. If you go behind this book, you'll find actually a definition for all the, wor for all the words that they use in Kabbalah. For example, Gadlut, Katnut, Galgalta, and so on. Okay. Rightio yeah, then. Just a few more things to read for us to get our definitions and our vision in the right place so we don't sidetrack from the text. I'm going to read something from page 23, uh, and this is quite important. I'll just read from the text in front of me. Many believe that all the, worlds, all the words and the names in the wisdom of Kabbalah are a kind of abstract names. This is so because it deals with godliness and spirituality, which are above time and space, where even our imagination has no hold. For this reason, they have decided that surely these matters speak only of abstract names or even more sublime and exalted than abstract names as they are completely and from the outset devoid of elements that are imagined. Just to continue a bit more, but that is not the case. On the contrary, Kabbalah uses only names and appellations that are concrete and real. It is an unbending rule for all Kabbalists that anything we do not attain, we do not define by a name and a word. Here you must know that the word attainment, 
Hasaga in Hebrew implies the ultimate degree of understanding. It derives from the phrase that thy hand shall reach. That means that before something becomes utterly lucid, as though gripped in one's hand, Kabbalists do not consider it attained, but understood, comprehended, and so on. Now this is a very, very important principle, as the Rav also mentioned in his clip. Any Kabbalist who writes text must have, if it's authentic Kabbalah, must have an absolute understanding in order for him to give that name to that specific, give that word to that specific phenomena. So what they're talking about are very, very concrete things. So if we were seeing reality as they were seeing, and if we were naming this, for example, this marker, um, like a spiritual item, they would understand exactly what it was relating to. Okay? They see one reality, and because they see one reality, I mean, here we only see and feel the corporeal, but a Kabbalist is the seeing through all the degrees, from the corporeal to the spiritual. So he can actually call names to any physical phenomena in order to describe something really specific and that is tangible in the spiritual world. So for us, reality is divided into two, but for a Kabbalist, okay, everything is one reality. For these guys, this is all one. Okay? And in our limited sensation, we only are dealing, unfortunately, at the moment, at the moment, we're getting there, so it's not such a negative thing, we're working on it, we're only dealing with this world. However, as we study and as we learn from the text that they wrote for us, the study, as you learned in your previous lesson, lessons, attracts something called the surrounding light, which will help us to come to those sensations, those feelings, from which afterwards we can have a complete attainment and understanding of the causes. And just a bit more about this uh, excerpt where Bala Salam says how you know, many believe that the concepts in the wisdom of Kabbalah are abstract and all these terms and all this language of Kabbalah, uh, that it's as if abstract, you know, that uh, it's a very important point that we need to get past. And this is one of the points of this lesson, uh, that w what Kabbalists, what Bala Salam is saying here is that Kabbalists say that, no, all these terms that they're speaking about, there's, there's nothing abstract at all above them. The only thing is that our current senses, our five senses, sight, smell, touch, hearing, taste, have no perception, have no attainment of the place or, or have no attainment of, of the roots of, of where these words come from. And therefore, many people who are not Kabbalists over history, uh, many, for example, f people who blended Kabbalah with philosophy and all kinds of teachings of this world, all kinds of mystical teachings or or tarot, numerology, and countless other ologies. So they would be taking Kabbalistic texts, putting them through their level of understanding, which is a level of understanding at, at, at this world, and then coming up with the kind of philosophizing about all these terms, philosophizing that you know this term means that, and this term means that, and, and, and treating these terms as if they're abstract. So this is something that's very important to ground ourselves in uh, from this lesson and onwards, that when we're dealing with Kabbalistic text, that we're dealing with something where every single term speaks to a very specific, concrete, and real phenomenon in the spiritual, term, in the spiritual world, which we yet cannot perceive while we only have the perception at the level of our five senses, while we only have the level of perception of our world or this world. And therefore, it's, it's only pointing to the fact that we need to uh, use these texts as a means to attain those causes, which we still haven't gotten into yet in this lesson. Uh, but th that's still a point here where it's very important to note that we're not speaking about anything abstract here, but we're speaking about a very, re very real concepts. And as well, since we don't perceive it, it seems like it's something very difficult and very... Uh, it's as if not, not, not real because we don't yet perceive it. 
but the whole idea is that once we attain the wisdom, then it becomes as real as everything we currently see before us now. It, it's as real as me just uh, touching this computer and, and the mouse here and, and, and you looking at this screen and the video and the computer and, and et cetera, et cetera. Just like we see all these colors and, and perceive things with our five senses, the, the minute we attain that additional sense of spirituality and, and can attain those causal levels and attain what these Kabbalists speak about, it's, it's as simple as just, uh, just, you know, just a person writing about, you know, here is this table, here is this computer, here is my interaction with this table and computer with another person, etc., etc. You know, like a person writing a story here in, in this world, obviously a lot more interesting than, than that. Uh, but but that, that's basically the, the, the fundamental point behind this. Absolutely. So it's like, you know, if also they're describing it to us like if we were talking to someone, God forbid, completely blind, okay, as if, you know, let's, let's say we had a third person and me and Marcos were having a conversation about this world, about the plants and, the, I don't know, the sunset or whatever. Uh, for that person, that would be completely like imaginary, okay, because he's not in there, he's not seeing all that. So it's, for us, the Kabbalists' texts are kind of like that. However, we do have an opportunity to move forward. And let's do that right now. So the Kabbalists basically have come up with a way for, for us to understand spiritual worlds by describing to us in the, world, in the words of this world. We're going to carry on reading. But before we carry on reading, on page 26, I'd like to touch um, to the last paragraph on page 25, okay? Um, it's really it's something really nice that we should read. Um, it's the last paragraph, and this is the Kabbalists, what the Kabbalists are saying. That was the intention of our sages when they said, You haven't a blade of grass below that has not a fortune, and a guard above that strike it and tells it to grow. It follows that the root called fortune compels it to grow and assume its attribute in quantity and quality, as with the seal and the imprint. Okay, so basically the reason I wanted to say this and touch base on this was, on a good reason, is if we divide our reality, we here, and this is our world, This little sentence that we just read now pretty much tells us that everything that happens here, even a grass that is growing, has its root, and that root touches this world. So all of us, everything that we go through in life, they're all impacted by things that happen in the spiritual world known as the roots. And here are the branches. So this is just another way of looking at things. Okay, So everything that happens to us, things that we feel, think, are all coming from there. All right. Just to read a little further, although there's a bit of reading we are doing, the whole idea behind it in this course also is to get you guys to use to kind of understanding what how Baal HaSalam is writing and to get into his text. So it's very good if you're after the lesson as well, you could go through the text on your own as well. So let's continue to read on page 26. Kabbalists have found a set of annotated vocabulary sufficient to create an excellent spoken language. It enables them to converse with one another of the dealings in the spiritual roots in the upper worlds by merely mentioning the tangible branch in this world that is well defined to our corporeal senses. The listeners understand the upper root to which this corporeal branch points because it is related to it, being its imprint. Thus, all the beings of the tangible creation and all their instances have become to them like well-defined words and names, 
indicating the high spiritual roots. Although there cannot be a verbal expression in their spiritual place, as it is above any imagination, they have earned the right to be expressed by utterance through their branches, arranged before our senses here in the tangible world. That is the nature of the spoken language among Kabbalists, by which they convey their spiritual attainments from person to person and from generation to generation, both by word of mouth and in writing. They fully understand one another with all the required accuracy needed for negotiating in research of the wisdom. All right. So from our study, by reading the text, and sometimes they're talking about like this world, we shall come to attain the roots in order to actually connect everything with the spiritual. And that is the gist of the study. In your previous lessons, you learned about learning through intention, how the intention needs to change. You also learned that studying Kabbalah is not something intellectual, but it's through a desire. Okay? And we also touched on the point of the light that reforms during our study. So if you like, kind of squeeze all the lessons that you've done previously to come to this lesson now, lesson number six, you can now kind of chain it all together and relate to this lesson that as we study the texts which talk to us in the la language of roots and branches and want to learn through our desire to attain spirituality, those roots should kind of illuminate onto us that surrounding light that should make that inner change in us which the Rav talked about in his clip which should bring us a new sensation and that new sensation should bring us to the attainment and the understanding, a complete understanding of that spiritual phenomena. Okay? So up to lesson number six, if you kind of like put everything together, why they wrote it in this way is pretty logical. They want us to learn through that growing desire, through that growing and yearning so that we can want to be in the spiritual world. And since we are a desire to receive, wanting to be in the spiritual world is actually where the Creator wants to bring us in the first place through the thought of creation. That attracts His light and attracts us up and that will take us to the roots as well. So that's actually what's called a miracle in Kabbalah. If you're asking also what's a miracle in spirituality, Spirit in spirituality there's only one miracle, that inner change that we go through as we study by the light that reforms. Yeah, that's actually um, the, the whole next lesson in this course, uh, lesson number seven, is precisely on what Mutlu was just talking about now, the idea of learning through desire and not learning through intellect, which is also a hard concept for us to grasp because we're used to coming to a study, especially where we're studying out of books and texts with teachers, and we're used to approaching that with our intellect, trying to understand, and especially in the first stages, like now when we're learning the fundamentals of the wisdom, uh, definitely. You know, and we're always, we always have our intellect and our desire, and we always have to use them both. But what we end up learning is through all, these learning of, uh, through all this learning of the fundamental principles and basic concepts of the wisdom of Kabbalah, we end up coming to the conclusion that in, when we come and sit before a text written in the language of Kabbalah, which only speaks about spirituality, which only speaks about the roots of creation and everything which is above the level of this world, then our intellect has no grasp of that at all. Our intellect, which is built from our, uh, what we can perceive through our five senses and everything we know in this world and everything we can imagine, it's all above that. It's, it's beyond even our wildest imagination. Because even think about imagination. Every possible thing you can, you can ever imagine is still based on some kind of thing within time, space, and motion, which connects to our five senses. You know, the wildest fantasies and everything, it's still taking up some kind of form somehow in, in time, space, or motion. And spirituality is above time and space. It's above all these things. So it's above imagination too. Uh, therefore, what does it mean to study these texts? It means that there needs to be some other kind of approach to these texts which 
uh, isn't related to our intellect, isn't related to just feeding something within our, our brain that we can grasp onto, but which is outside that, which is above the level of our intellect. And therefore, we approach all these Kabbalistic texts while we're here in this world with the desire to attain the higher level. And we, as I said, we'll have a whole lesson about that. But just in short, when we approach these texts with that desire to attain the higher level, meaning we come with that desire for spirituality, the desire to attain the meaning of life, and we want to yearn to discover this higher level, and we don't know what that higher level is either. We have no idea. This is also something very unique about the wisdom of Kabbalah, that, that the goal that we're aiming for, which we learned in the first lesson, the goal being the revelation of the Creator to us people while we're here in this world, that goal we can't envision because it is, again, beyond our wildest imagination, beyond what we can ever perceive within our five senses. It, it exists in a whole new sense of reality that we have to develop in order to perceive there. So by approaching the texts in this way where we somehow want something that uh, is this next state of existence and we somehow know that it's related to a state of us being much more uh, bestowing, much more connected, much more loving than we currently are now and somehow wanting that and just inserting even our slightest desire even without much direction into that as much as we can. So what that starts doing is that whole system that's being described in those texts starts illuminating upon us, it starts illuminating upon our desire. And that illumination, uh, it's called the influence of the surrounding light, or the or makif in, in the Kabbalistic language. And, and that starts actually working on us, and that starts changing us, and, and that starts giving us all kinds of new discernments that we never previously had. And that's really the, as, as Motley said, that, that brings us to this miracle. That, that's what brings us to these inner changes that we undergo, which, which eventually lead us towards that attainment. And even early in the wisdom, even at any point, even before we get that full spiritual attainment, we can always approach the text in this way and get some of that illumination and f start feeling new things to what we've felt in any other wisdom. And that's what brings people to, to that next level in the study of the wisdom, when they start feeling the influence of the surrounding light and start working with it. And the strongest place of the influence of the surrounding light is when we're studying the texts in the language of Kabbalah uh, with the guidance of the teacher who, who guides us towards them. Uh, in our case, that is in the daily Kabbalah lessons with Rav Michael Leitman. There's always a portion of the daily Kabbalah lessons which is dedicated to the study of the Kabbalistic texts. Uh, usually there's a portion where we study from Talmud Esa Sfirot, the study of the Ten Sfirot, which is written in the language of roots and branches, which is written in the language of Kabbalah, uh, as well as the study of the Zohar with the Sulam commentary by Bala Sulam, uh, which also is the language of the Zohar, the language of the Midrash, together with the language of Kabbalah, uh, interpreting the language of the Midrash. We'll, sp we'll speak also about the different kinds of languages and the purposes of each more in this course. But that's more or less the, the reason why we study these texts while we still don't have attainment of it. And uh, just quickly before we get back to it, it's similar as well to a, to a baby, for instance. Now, a baby gets all kinds of toys and, 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 and plays, with, uh, plays with its friends all kinds of higher states. We, we see it from life itself, children. We see how it's embedded into nature, this, this process. You know, ch children play as if they want to become a fireman and I want to be, become a policeman. And, and, and children see all kinds of examples that their parents are doing, that society around them is doing, and start, without even knowing what they're doing, start kind of acting out these things. And gr what that's actually doing is it's attracting those higher levels, those more advanced levels upon the children. And, and it's what actually develops them to, to develop these forms of behavior and, and forms of all, all these templates within themselves intellectually, emotionally, and also in their behavior. And it's very similar here as well with the, with the texts of Kabbalah. The only difference being that the actual goal we have no perception of, whereas there you can actually see, in our world we can always see the goal we're moving towards. I can see what it means to become a fireman, or I can see what it means to become a policeman. Here I can't see what it means to reveal the Creator, 
but with some kind of desire for something that I can picture to myself now as being more bestowal, more giving, more loving, more, more in connection with others and with the creator. So that taking that desire to the text illuminates the surrounding light and, and we start undergoing changes. Absolutely. It's also interesting that it's not just for kids, but for us as well. For example, if we wanted to learn a musical instrument, the first thing we start with is a desire, isn't it? Because we are a desire to receive. So if I want to learn a musical instrument, I start you know, with that desire and I start digging into how I can learn better. And same here, when we have a dot in the heart, okay, we have an aspiration for the meaning of life, that dot in the heart awakens in us. And what we do is we do exactly what we do in this world. We study, okay? And through the study, we learn. And this is what actually a Kabbalah group is. We come together, we study the principles, we read the books, and we try to learn as best we can with the friends around us, with an environment that supports that growth in order to attain something that we just don't have at the moment. Same with musicians, same with people who practice sport. For example, you go to sport clubs or gyms or whatever, because people there work together and they get inspired by one another. So they're actually using the same technique that is natural in the world. We use the help of other people, the environment. We use books, the knowledge of what our predecessors you know, found out so we don't have to reinvent the wheel, wheel every time and therefore move forward. And just like in our next lesson, we're going to learn one interesting phenomena here is going to be the light. And other than that, though, everything is pretty, pretty basic. Okay, so that should be the light to influence us. But everything else is very, very practical. So there's no need to really invent anything new here. This, these are actually laws of nature. Kabbalah is explaining, is, is explaining to us the laws of nature and how we can develop you know, in a, in a uh, compliant way without any uh, suffering or without any uh, negative impact on our lives. I might just throw at you a question because you already started relating to it. And from Peru is asking, uh, how do we get to the motivation to try to bestow if we know that we are doing it because of our ego? Because I've got friends. Okay, <laughs> That's the best thing. Listen, the best way to do anything in life is with friends, right? Because we, when, actually this is how we feel life. If I was living alone in the jungle, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't really feel what it means to do anything with other people because there's no other people around me. So if my goal is to come to some kind of connection with somebody else. I need an environment that is going to facilitate that. If it doesn't, then you know we're just going to be a single guy in the jungle mixed with the animals, and all I will be doing is exactly what the animals would be doing because that's my environment. Now, if I was to want, if I was to incline with this dot in the heart that's pushing me to discover the Creator, and I come to the study, and we're studying now about what to do, how to do, and why to do. And let's say the guys, the Kabbalistic, um, the Kabbalists wrote in their Kabbalistic text, said, listen, you know what? To come to the love of the Creator, or to come to bestow, let's say, you know, to come to give from the heart, you need to actually start giving to someone. Okay? So in order to start giving to someone, in order to start doing that practice, like going to the gym and lifting the weights, right? I have to have friends around. I have to have an environment and that's what we do in Kabbalah. We actually, that's the only thing actually we do in Kabbalah. We try to build for ourselves an environment that stimulates spiritual growth. Because like you very well said, it's against our nature. We don't really, really want to give, but we can start with that inclination that the Creator gave us. And if we start building a framework for ourselves, we can then start to do the actions. For example, you are now learning at the learning center, right? And there's me, Marcos, Bill's in there, our tech guy, you know. We're here trying to help you guys out, right? So that we can all actually learn from Dr. Ralph Lightman, you know, 
the wisdom and we can build ourselves a nice environment. Now, it's 3.50 a.m. here. So in order to get here um, and start giving a lesson at 3 and start to you know, prepare myself and everything, we have to wake up around 1, quarter past 1 in the morning. Now, tomorrow is Monday, okay? First day of the week. So that's going to be pretty tough for us, right? However, although it is going to be pretty tough for us, what we've built for ourselves is a system that facilitates helping other people to spiritually grow. Now, once you facilitate that, once you build an environment for that, you actually start to do things, even though you may not want to do them, and that actually brings you extra strength. Now, don't ask me how it happens, okay? But the best way to do is to start doing, just like with kids. We give them a jigsaw puzzle and we say, let's do it. You start doing it. If you've got a problem, let me know. We'll do it together. And that's how kids grow. That's how we grew as well. When we first came to Kabbalah, we started learning online as well. And the friends helped us out. And we started building an environment for ourselves where we could enter that environment and start working and working and working. And once you start working, you... All of a sudden, even though I have to go to work on a Monday morning and wake up early for that, you think, you know what, I do need to go and help the friends and I think that's the right thing to do. It kind of like happens inside of you. You begin to feel the change inside and that's only through actions. So through the study and through the participation, you will begin to do things that are seemingly against our nature, but afterwards will become a part of our nature and we will want to do them and we'll want to do them with great joy and happiness. Just to add a little bit to, to Mutlu about um, how do we get this motivation if we know that we're doing it because of our ego. So uh, definitely the environment uh, and, and putting the environment around ourselves uh, just like with anything in life and also this example Mut Mutlu said that you know you, you see these children who have grown up uh, in isolation from other people. Uh, you can look it up, just type feral children in Google and, and you'll see examples of that and, and you'll see how a person who grows up among wild animals ends up acting and, and being just like the wild animals. Um, and it's like that here. We can choose our environment which influences us and, and develops us. But the whole uh, point here is like, how can we keep moving forward towards bestowal if I keep knowing that everything I do is out of my own ego? And, and I'm just doing it to, to please myself. Even this, even this initial desire to want to bestow, it's an egoistic desire. I want to do it because ultimately I, feel, I think that bestow will make me feel good. Uh, that, that's correct because the motivation in this case will always be egoistic. It will always be in order to give myself pleasure because we have nothing else to work with at the moment. That's, that's our human nature. That's, that's our matter. That, that's what we're made of. That, that, that will to receive pleasure is, is the very substance or matter of creation. It's also described in, in the wisdom of Kabbalah this way. So, but, but as it's also written in the wisdom of Kabbalah, there's a saying, from lo lishma, we come to lishma, meaning that from not for the sake of the creator, meaning not for the sake of bestowal itself and, and, and uh, lishma being for bestowal itself, for the sake of doing an action out of pure bestowal, a purely altruistic action without any self-interest or, or egoistic intention connected to it. And that is literally the definition of spirituality. So, but we, we start doing all kinds of actions of bestowal, which are not exactly actions of bestowal because we're still doing them with this egoistic intention. But that's how it begins, meaning that in all of our social desires where we want respect, where we want honor and to look good in front of others and, and to be appreciated in society, it starts from, in this level, reorganizing the environment to value bestowal through all those things, meaning that we, when we put ourselves among these kinds of friends and among this kind of environment that appreciates and respects bestowal, and doesn't really appreciate or respect all kinds of forms of self-interest, which is really what uh, this whole Western culture is based on. You know, we respect who's richer, who's faster, who's stronger. We give medals and, and prizes and, and everything to the person who's better than the other people. It's all about being the, the best possible individual 
you know, better than all the other individuals as you can be. That, that's really the, the, the competitive nature of our values in, in Western society in general. So if we keep going like that, there's no, there's no way we can, we can achieve spirituality. But that initial motivation while we're in such a society comes from, firstly, from our, what's called our inner reshimo. It comes from our inner, this desire that pops up, this desire for spirituality, a desire for something more than what this society is constantly projecting to me, all those values. Suddenly I start getting this question, hang on a sec, working according to these values all the time is not going to fulfill me. And that's the awakening of that new level of desire for spirituality. That, that's actually the question, what is the meaning of life? Where even though we might not ask that question verbally, we, we just start getting dissatisfied with all these the values of society and how society is working according to these values. And that's what makes us go and search. So even that initial motivation is that start of this higher ego, this higher ego, desire for spirituality, meaning a bigger ego, meaning that we're not satisfied with all the other levels of desire. That what, that's what makes us search. And then when we find that method and we encase ourselves in that new environment, so that new environment starts projecting to us new values, values where bestowal is, is great and it's good to appreciate and respect actions of bestowal and altruistic things and, and love uh, and rather than, you know, who's the best individual. It's like who, who can best contribute to the connection of everyone and, and, and let's, let's respect the, the idea of everyone being together as one and, and uh, rather, than, rather than these other values. So when we're working in, in that, so we, we're still getting this egoistic fuel, but it starts grounding us already for spirituality. We're already setting up a different foundation for ourselves. The foundation is still in the ego. And then at a certain point, through working uh, with those new values, and while we study these Kabbalistic texts, which are, attract that next level towards us all the time, the surrounding light, we gradually, gradually, gradually undergo a change where no longer is that egoistic fuel important to us, that, that idea of being respected or feeling good in my ego, but we truly start valuing bestowal itself. We truly start thinking only in concern uh, for what's outside of me and for others instead of what, what, what will give me self-benefit. And uh, that change comes as a result of the light influencing us and working on us, which we'll learn more about in the next lesson. Absolutely. And not to fear, all right? Because if I'm bestowing, 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 what's going to happen to me? Okay, don't have a fear like that. For example, anyone who bestows actually continues to do that with a lot of force and never gets tired. And that's a nice little trick we'll attain along the way. <laughs> okay, there's lots of questions coming in. Nice. Um, just a quick technical question. Uh, Crystal from Austin was asking, may any individual tell me what is the name of the book and its author that is being read today, please? I certainly shall. This is a book you can find in our book store. It's called Kabbalah for the Student. It's a green book. It's a bit like an encyclopedia, but actually it has everything we need for spiritual attainment. Okay, so it's very, very worthwhile to grab one of these. Okay, and I do believe there's, um, like when you come to the learning center, you have like a pack of few books. Yeah, um, student that you package. Have. You have a student pack. I'd just grab one of those because we're going to be going through this book a lot. Yeah, just a couple of words about this book as well. It's got a few authors, including Bala Sulam, Rabash, uh, Bala Sulam being Kabbalist Judah Ashlag, Rabash being Kabbalist Baruch Shalom Halevi Ashlag, who was the son and disciple of Bala Sulam. And all, all the articles and texts in this book were handpicked by Rav Michael Leitman, who's the founder and teacher at the B'nai Baruch Kabbalah Education and Research Institute, where we're teaching at. Uh, so they were handpicked as being the most important texts to give a person this initial grounding in the, fundament, in the fundamental principles and basic concepts of the wisdom of Kabbalah. And we're constantly studying out of this book. It's not just the book which is here for the fundamentals course, but if you progress onwards to the intermediate course and to the young group after that, and if you then move on to the daily Kabbalah lessons, we're always studying from this book. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's like the fundamental textbook of, you could say, B'nai Baruch, where we're always, even in the daily lessons, studying these same articles. We're going over them again and again. And we also learn why we go over them again and again, because each time we're changing and seeing new things through these articles. Uh, so that, that's the book. And the specific article we read from today is called The Essence of the Wisdom of Kabbalah by Bala Sulam. 
Francisco from Brazil. Does the chosen name of each concept have a relation to the numeric value of that name in Hebrew? Um, <clears throat> gematria, so I guess you're talking about gematria. Uh, gematria is a way um, that Kabbalists use to express themselves because Hebrew words have a, have a numeric value as well. Okay? They didn't have numbers. What they used was um, the letters of the alphabet to also give numbers. For example, Aleph is A, it also means 1. Bet is B, it also means 2. So they did use these methods in order to express things. A very, very common one uh, in Gematria Elohim also means Teva in their numeric value. So it means nature, right? So when they're talking about um, Elohim, they're also actually talking about Teva. So when they say God or the Creator, they're talking about nature, which is Teva. So there is a relationship like that. However, for spiritual attainment, that's not really relevant, okay? Because the way they describe those things of actually how they developed that understanding and that attainment. So once you come to the attainment, you can actually describe spirituality in many, many ways, not just in numerology. For us, what is really, really relevant is to get that first sensation of spirituality, that first degree of attainment. So that is the place um, that we should target and give maximum effort to. Okay, uh, Jared uh, from PA, so I think Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania yeah. in, other in, in other traditions, something that might be called attainment of the Creator is a consequence of repeating the name or names of the Creator. Does Kabbalah have a similar method, or is it, as the texts suggest, forbidden to speak about prior to attainment? Um, we don't have such chanting or mantras um, about repeating the Creator's names. Actually, I'll tell you something else. Every word in the Pentateuch, in the five books of Moses, is actually known for being the names of the Creator. What does it mean? the name of the Creator. Creator is an attribute of bestowal. And the name of the Creator is me attaining His bestowal to me. It's like attaining every root, because the root is how He bestows to us in a specific way. Okay, it's like I drew here in the, in the drawing. Let's just come back to the drawing here. Okay, so the Creator actually what he's doing is bestowing to us all the time. Okay, that's his bestowal to us. Now, you will note here that this is a one-way street. Okay, so he's bestowing down. So the way he bestows under one condition or one situation is it's a one-way street. In order for me to really understand him, I have to attain the root here. When I attain that, I've actually attained the name of the Creator because Creator described to us is not some phenomena like Father Christmas or some guy up on the clouds looking down on us. The Creator is an action of bestowal upon me. So this is why we say also in Kabbalah that Kabbalists say that we know the Creator by His actions, by what He does on me. All right. So actually every word in the Torah that describes only the relationship between man and his maker can be called the names of the Creator. So there's a lot of names there, but as we attain, we will attain all of those actions and all of those thoughts that combine together are influencing us in order to get spiritual. Okay, uh, Gant from Nashville. Did the Kabbalists obtain the upper worlds through study and feeling alone? Well, feeling alone is a bit of a problem, all right? And except Adam, the first man, okay, everybody had a teacher. Everybody had someone that passed it on. Um, now, the reason, well, Adam seemingly attained without anyone was because he's the first man. Actually, he is... If we look at the whole of reality, all right, he is actually that dot in the heart, okay? That spark that the Creator awakened himself. So his initial attainment <clears throat> in its pure form was from a simple desire 
to learn who created me and what I'm doing here. All right? But after Adam, even Adam himself, after he attained spirituality, what did the first thing he do? He taught his family. All right? Because in spirituality, if you want to practice bestowal, you must have people to bestow to. Otherwise, how can we learn? All right? So this is why it's very important that when I'm learning, in our generation especially, there is no someone is just going to miraculously learn spirituality out of the blue. It needs to come through an environment, through a teacher, and through the participation of the individual. Just like our kids, if I don't take my kid to school and I don't teach him anything, he's not going to learn anything. All right, so all we need to do is to be very, very pragmatic and take the same things that we do in this world. If I want to learn something, I need to go and study it. If I want to teach my children something, I have to teach them what I've attained. And this is how spirituality also works. So we need a guide, a Rav, which is Dr. Michael Lightman. He is our teacher. So through him, we study, we teach the texts that were written to us by the Kabbalists in order to get spiritual attainment. Yeah, and it's also important to note that from Abraham onwards, uh, Abraham, you could say, is the second most, uh, after Adam, he was the second Kabbalist in history who's, who holds a special significance. Uh, everyone studied in groups as well. And, and to, so together with the teacher and the study, the teacher guiding the study, people would also work on, on how to bestow and how to love and how to connect uh, in the group and how to realize these principles and, and, the, the, and what's being taught in the context of a group. Uh, Eric from Grand Rapids is asking, should we aspire to only follow along with the lessons instead of worrying about how to bestow, for example? Will this course lead us through the steps to awaken us? Well, first of all, you probably had an awakening, okay? But if you came to study Kabbalah, you know, you're obviously searching for something, right? Because if you, if you felt good and everything was honky-dory in life, you wouldn't really <clears throat> search for Kabbalah or be here. So there's obviously something missing inside that you feel needs fulfillment and you came to study. What this course um, is trying to do is to actually... Um, bring a person to start studying um, from the morning lessons, from the Rav, in a stable way. This course aspires to give the student the right approach to the study, the right um, way to integrate him or herself to the study. And hopefully, by giving the fundamentals um, by teaching you the approach to the study, hopefully what we're aspiring to do, wanting really to do, is to have all of you guys study with us, you know, on the same bench in the morning or whenever at your time, whenever it's convenient for you, from Dr. Lightman, and to learn together, actually. What we're trying to do in this course is to raise the student as soon as and as quickly as humanly possible um, to basically to sit in front of the Rav and to learn from him with the right approach. That's what this course should give you. In order for that, um, at this stage, the most advisable recommended thing would be for you to read as much as you can and to go over, over these lessons as much as you can so that you can actually build that approach. Um, like I said in the beginning also, if you were to go over the essence of the wisdom of Kabbalah after the lesson, in your free time until your next lesson, that would be really good because that kind of gives you a base um, as to, and it kind of like complements what we did now because we just read a few paragraphs here now and now you understand what root and branch is. When you go and read that afterwards, it kind of makes more sense. It kind of stabilizes you. So studying um, and adding to your study afterwards in your spare time is going to really strengthen the foundation so that when you come to the study you won't be out there you know being confused because Kabbalah is a spiritual study which can confuse a person and and the wrong approach has confused humanity for thousands of years as you can see with all kinds of religions all kinds of superstitions all kinds of approaches to life from I don't know from charms to to holy waters or red strings in your, on your wrist, you know, trying to change your luck in life. Nothing like that is going to help you. It's just a 
you know, it's just a very childish approach to living a real um, experience of reality. So the more you study you do, the more you repeat the lessons, it'll help you integrate yourself better into the study. Another beautiful thing about the wisdom of Kabbalah is that it's, uh, it's not any kind of ethical system, but it's a, it's a method where you, which works according to a person's desire as well. So a person can, can literally be studying the wisdom of Kabbalah for years if, if they want, and just have this intention to study it intellectually. I'm not saying that this is the correct approach to the wisdom of Kabbalah, but we're saying that a, a person's intention for why they come and, and study the wisdom of Kabbalah, it's hidden and, and it's inside the person themselves. So a person can come and really take from the wisdom whatever they want to take from it. Uh, it's the job of the environment, being the, the teacher, the, the group, and, and the books, to try to guide the person towards spiritual attainment as much as possible. But then a person, according to their desire, comes and, and can take from, uh, from that whatever they, they like, and at, at their own pace as well. If a person feels that you know, trying to bestow and trying to love, it's, it's too much for the person. And I think definitely in, in the start of the introductory course, it might, it might just be. So just, just keep following along with the lessons. Uh, and as Mutlu said, it, it's a great idea just to go to the website, kabbalah.info, start reading through a bunch of the materials there. Uh, I'd even recommend going and, and, and getting one or two books. For example, if you, get the, in, if you get that fundamentals package, you'll also get a book there, which is uh, unlike Kabbalah for the student, which are source texts and which really need guidance to understand them and approach them properly. Uh, these are good to come to the lessons with. But uh, you also books like, uh, for example, Attaining the Worlds Beyond is a great book where Rav Leitman just gives this emotional outpouring of the fundamental principles and concepts of the wisdom of Kabbalah. So you can just read it and absorb the, the concepts and, and, and really start feeling it. There's lots of videos as well on our, on our YouTube channel. And, uh, and you can follow the articles that get updated on a daily basis through, uh, the, through the Kabbalah blog. And, and there's just like lots of materials out there. And you can just absorb yourself in the materials. And, and in the, especially in the beginning, even though we say that the study is through desire, not intellect, we come with the intellect. And it's good just to try to understand the things and, and really get grounded in it as much as possible. So yes, definitely keep following along with the lessons and see if you can add to that more materials and things. And gradually we'll, we'll move on to the intermediate and, and the young group. The young group is the third part of this whole course, Fundamentals Intermediate Young Group, where we already start doing some kind of work as a virtual group. And, and you can also get introduced to local groups and you'll have a bit of a grounding to go towards the groups if you like. And when we start doing the group work more and more, that's when the actual approach of how to bestow becomes much more relevant. At this stage, just it's good to get a, try to get this picture uh, and this whole mechanism of, of what is spirituality and how it works uh, embedded as much as possible. Maybe just one, one more question, because we're coming close to the end of time. Uh, we're kind of coming close to the end of the lesson. Uh, Apollos from Peru is asking, if all, including us, comes from the eternal root uh, and everything the everything is spiritual in different stages of manifestation. Why do we need to create this kind of dichotomy at each level of manifestation, especially our own world, uh, which is in, almost in opposition? Um, our world is actually completely in opposition, not almost. Um, but um, as we learned in the perception of reality, we did, we, um, did write the perception of reality. Um, in order for us to attain anything, all right, we have to have something completely opposite, like 100% opposite. Black, white, night, light, sweet, bitter, everything, beautiful, ugly. And everything is necessary, everything in the creation. And everything in creation must have two opposite sides in order for us to understand the complete spectrum of reality. Therefore, the way the Creator created our reality, now we perceive it through our egoistic senses, is completely opposite to the Creator's, let's say, character or approach or, or relationship to us. 100% 
opposite. This is why um, it's kind of when we moving on in spirituality, it's kind of like going against our nature. All right, so because we're trying to discover something that's really against our nature, this giving, where our nature is one hundred percent reception. It needs to happen for us to attain the difference, and then by attaining the difference, the the good and the bad, I actually have an opportunity to choose. What makes the created being so special is that he has an ability to choose. And in order for me to make a cho choice, a free choice, I have to know the two opposite ends of things. So that spectrum, as I attain from the negative to the positive, everything, that depth is actually the degrees of the worlds. This is why they say it's like um, it's identical worlds, right? Everything is identical in the same world. So one world is a root to the other world, which is a branch, and then that world is a root for the lower one, which is a branch, and so on. We're all seeing the same reality, but what I'm going into is a deeper understanding. I'm going in all the details of what's going on, and that is the full spectrum. And if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have attainment. So we need to have the two opposites in its maximum form for us to have that full picture and the full attainment. Remember, we're trying to get to the level of the Creator. Okay? And it's not just, uh, you know, I saw this world and I saw the next world. I saw everything here and saw everything there. So it's really going to be detailed. Okay, guys, we're already over time, so we have to let, let it go there. Uh, well, there's plenty more questions. Please uh, feel free to take your questions to the student forum on the website, and there we have moderators and instructors who are ready to answer them. Uh, your next lesson will be this coming Wednesday, May the 6th, same time, same place. And it's not in the announcements, but I'm going to fill you in on a little bit of a secret. At the end of July, uh, the last weekend of July, that's July 24th to 26th, we're going to be holding our next North American Congress, meaning a Congress in New Jersey, in America. We'll definitely be talking about it more coming up to that, and we'll be giving you more details. But already, if you're already seeing that it's something uh, that, that you'd like to go to, and we definitely recommend it for everyone. It's something that, that always gives everyone who participates a, a huge boost and, and a big... Uh, a big push forward, both spiritually and also just in terms of meeting all kinds of m meeting each other. You know, instead of just seeing each other as names and, and places on the on the screen. Uh, so again, the end of July, uh, Rav Leitman will be there. Will be there, and it, it'll it'll be a great experience. Uh, July twenty fourth to twenty sixth. For the time being, you can just set your calendar aside for that. Uh, and start looking for the cheap flights, the cheap early flights to New Jersey, if you like. Uh, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> there you go. So I just thought I'd fill you in on, on, on that, and, and we'll be talking more about it coming up soon, too. So, yeah, thanks okay. a lot, Mutlu, and thank you all as well. Thank you. Thank you for everyone, and uh, we'll see you hopefully next time. <laughs> Have a great day, great night, wherever you are.